The US might be moving towards another partial government shutdown with federal agencies set to run out of money soon. Why does this keep happening so regularly? Latest numbers from the UN Refugee Agency point to a horrific number of deaths among migrants fleeing to Europe. Why is the toll escalating? These are your stories for the day. This is the Daily Debrief. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Our first story is from the United States where legislators are scrambling to avoid a partial government shutdown, the fourth in a decade. This comes as Republicans and Democrats were unable to agree on a deal for government spending, leading to concerns over the salaries of millions of federal employees. Now, this kind of dysfunction has become extremely common in the United States. And to understand why, we go to Eugene Purier of Breakthrough News. Eugene, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this talking about shutdowns or the possibility of shutdowns has almost become an annual thing here for us. And it's a bit confusing for many people, I suppose, many parts of the world, governments present budgets, they're voted on, and, you know, disagreements are dealt with in parliament, etc. So, could you maybe first for our viewers take us through why this question of a shutdown keeps coming up almost every year at this point? Yes, the U.S. government shutdown process is, uh, you know, very strange. It's essentially a neoliberal production. This is actually something that started in the Reagan administration when uh, one of his legal officials put a, an opinion out that if there's a disagreement over how to fund the government, that the government cannot continue its operations that are considered, quote unquote, non-essential, which is always debated what that was. So prior to 1980, the U.S. government would never shut down in this way. But since then, it's become a relatively frequent uh, occurrence and it's become even more frequent recently because it becomes a way the the government shutdowns the debt ceilings all these artificially created deadlines become a way for either of the two parties but oftentimes the republican party to use uh their minority status uh as you know or to use the status of these shutdowns as led a uh, leverage to get things that they wouldn't normally be able to get because they have minority support inside of the u.s congress and so almost as a matter of of course, the two parties always say they don't want these things to happen, but they always allow them to happen because here at the you know 11th hour type situation, it makes it easier to push through things that could never get majority support in Congress otherwise. But it really is due to a strange legal quirk from the neoliberal era. And the number one role it plays, and that's why I'm mentioning neoliberalism, is basically to make it easy to make big cuts to the budget that are so unpopular that they would never happen otherwise. So basically, it's a way of uh, reducing government, which is really the neoliberal dream, continues to be so. But in this specific case, could you tell us maybe what really, uh, what really is the contest here? Because we also hear about the Senate and the House of Representatives, uh, you know, processing two different kinds of bills. So what really is the contention about over here? So there's basically two levels of contention, but the main level of contention is within the Republican Party inside the House of Representatives. In the Senate, they are relatively united over passing a bill that could uh, fund the government, but they're also relatively united around passing a bill called a continuing resolution to give them more time to work it out between the Senate and the House. So in the U.S., basically, in situations like this, the Senate and the House pass a budget, then they conference with one another, and then they come up with a uniform thing that ends up becoming the budget. So the Senate is pretty much on one page. They've crafted their budget based on the agreement between President Biden and the Republicans in Congress around the debt ceiling. But inside of the House of Representatives, the far right, the most far right members of the Republican caucus have decided that they want to use this as an opportunity to make deep, deep cuts in spending that would never, ever be able to pass in a normal circumstance. And so they're they're dressing it up in procedural uh, means. And Matt Gates and some of these other individuals are saying that they just want to have what they call a regular order, that they think the process is wrong. But it's not really about the process. What it's about is they know that their minority position to make deep cuts to funding for Social Security, uh, which is retirement benefits for people, funding for Medicaid, which is the health care program for low income individuals, funding for food, funding for housing, all these different things that they know they could never get support. They're hoping if they shut the government down, that they'll then be able to use use that as leverage because Democrats may get uh, desperate as well as other Republicans as different services start to 
shut down over the next month when they run out of, of money. So this is really about a fight inside of the Republican Party about whether to push the most extreme agenda of cutting government spending for working class people to the bone or whether or not to stick to the deal that they made or something close to the deal that they made with President Biden. There's some elements of border security that are also involved. They want more money, so-called border security. They want more money, uh, the right wing Republicans for that. But it really comes down to the spending issues, I think, above and beyond anything else. And it comes down to the internal fight between sort of the far right and the ultra right in the Republican Party. Right, Eugene, in this context, uh, of course, also wanted to ask you about what really is the impact of this kind of a uh, uh, shutdown? Because uh, beyond the halls of Congress, it also affects people who are working for the government, people who are being paid by the government. So where do these, where does this impact really come when, it, when you talk about a shutdown? So it depends on how long it lasts, but there are a couple million federal workers that are at risk of losing significant income if it lasts over maybe a week or so. Really, in shutdowns that last a few days, very little things happen. But once you start to get to a couple weeks, federal workers start losing paychecks and many more services start to shut down. So some things will shut down right away, like national parks and so on and so forth that are considered non-essential. There's also what they call low risk food inspections. So they actually start shutting down some food inspections. But there are other things like, say, social security payments, uh, SNAP, which is a low income program for working class people who need help buying food. Those things for working class people who need help buying food. Those things can usually run for a month or so. Shutdowns that have lasted, you know, longer than about 30, 35 days. That's really when the bite starts to set in and the money they've saved and the different programs don't work. So it really is a matter of how long it lasts. But if it starts to last two weeks, three Three weeks, you're going to have millions of federal workers, you know, who have lost two paychecks and could be, you know, at risk of being evicted from their homes. You'll have many millions, tens of millions of low income, poor people unable to buy food, unable to access health care, unable to access other critical goods and services. So usually what happens is they try to wrap it up before that takes place. So how big of the impact, I think, will depend on how long it is, but it could be very, very significant. Tens of millions of people could struggle to eat, provide health care uh, and make their basic expenses week to week. Right, Eugene, of course, in this, uh, this is, I think, yet another example of what we often talked about, a particular kind of dysfunction that is at one level between two parties, but also, I think, is a larger product of how over the, over the decades, for that matter, like you were talking about the neoliberal state, but over the decades is basically, on the one hand, made government itself a bad thing in many ways, and on the other hand, also both uh, pushed both parties towards this philosophy of trying to cut spending as much as possible. Because even the Democrats uh, often keep, keep talking about the same thing: you know, we need to spend less, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, completely ignoring the state of millions of people, like you said. So, uh, what has kind of been the pushback on this? Because is there a different kind of thinking or a set of demands on uh, some of these issues? I think that what we see is that, you know, many social movements and, and trade unions and others have pointed out that all of these procedural hurdles need to just be stopped. I mean, almost all of them, basically, you could change the rules in some ways. I mean, this one is a little difficult with the shutdown because there is sort of a legal opinion. But of course, the Biden administration could just offer another legal opinion if they so chose about what was possible. Things like the filibuster, things like the debt ceiling. I mean, many of these, you know, they call them backstops in Congress that are designed to create create these crises that force these negotiations that end up cutting the budget, almost all these things are made up. None of them are in the Constitution. None of them are written in laws. All of them can be changed. So that's one of the big demands that's coming from people's movements in the United States, is that why do we even have these hurdles when they could easily be changed? And why is it that Democrats like President Biden are unwilling to use their own power to change them, to put them in a situation where you, know, you wouldn't have this type of thing and you wouldn't be able to blackmail the government like other individuals are? But because of the fact that this is part of the way the the both major parties keep the drift of the government moving in a sort of center right direction they actually have quite a bit of 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 desire to keep it the way it is because it makes sure that the demands of people's movements are harder to be heard in the halls of congress and in the halls of the white house because they'll just say oh well we can't do it you know because of this because of that so that's becoming a bigger rallying cry and i suspect it'll be a big part of the presidential campaign in 2024 of people trying to put pressure on biden to to make a big change in how he approaches some of these procedural issues
Right, thank you so much, Eugene. We'll, uh, you mentioned the campaign in 2024. I think a lot of uh, interesting times coming up for the country as a whole, especially with this kind of systemic dysfunction we often keep talking about. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. A report by a UN refugee agency official says that over 2,500 migrants have died or gone missing while trying to get to Europe from Africa this year. Now, on this show, we have often talked about what is called the Mediterranean refugee crisis, which is the suffering tens of thousands go through as they try to escape conflict and other crises, only to be treated in an extremely brutal way by European countries. Now, these very same European countries are discussing to figure out a way to share the load of refugees. And each country seems determined to throw the task to someone else. What is clear is that there is no analysis or concern of the needs of refugees or the reasons they are forced to leave. We go to Anish for details. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. So first of all, let's take a look at the report by the UN official, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, you know, quite alarming reports in terms of what is happening in the Mediterranean right now. It's an issue we've talked about often on this show, but what are the latest updates? Well, uh, the figures itself are quite alarming. Uh, what we're looking at is a very steep jump in uh, deaths in the Mediterranean. We have uh, spoken about this earlier as well, uh, where uh, like every year thousands are pretty much uh, you know dying on in the Mediterranean, or uh, and this is just the documented fatalities we are looking at when we do not know uh, how many of these undocumented uh, migrants have or refugees have gone missing, and a lot of these figures do not necessarily include those who went missing or you know. Uh, when the boats capsize. So this sort of perilous journey is being carried out almost annually right now. We're looking at about 250,000 uh, people who have attempted to cross into uh, Europe through the Mediterranean. And this, uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, either very uh, updated uh, cruise ships that uh, may be used for scrap, or in some cases, it's just, uh, you know, pieces of wood and rubber being put together, uh, you know, carrying uh, dozens of people, uh, which may just capsize at the a, a slightest of a storm. And that clearly shows uh, the dangers that, uh, you know, the current EU immig uh, immigration policy and refugee policy has. And we need to also remember, like most of these uh, capsizing uh, that we, that are documented are primarily uh, reported because uh, they are they, uh, they are victims of the send the boats back policies that many of the countries in not just South Europe but also uh, Western Europe are implementing these days, which actually cause uh, you know accidents that are uh, that uh, create this kind of tragedy almost annually right now. Well, in each context, of course, I think two or three important aspects to consider. One is the fact that one strategy of the European countries has to be it has been to sign deals with various countries that uh, you know that have uh, that have coastal or are our boarding points. Basically, we just saw Tunisia, we saw Egypt, for instance, where similar discussions are uh, have taken place. We of course know that similar to, uh, incidents took place in Libya. That also is big, a big part of the problem because these countries adopt a very uh, you know uh, very harsh to say the least, policy against refugees? Yeah, definitely. Uh, like uh, One of the most open policies that used to exist uh, in North Africa was basically under the Gaddafi's Libya. I mean, uh, and post-NATO, and this is what we have seen, like post-NATO invasion, how this entire uh, crisis actually just multiplied uh, to this sort of tragic proportions. Uh, but uh, this attempt to, uh, you know, sign deals with uh, North African countries uh, is pretty much trying to do away with their responsibility uh, to uh, refugees that are coming, uh, you know, to their borders. Many of the times, uh, you know, authorities in North Africa or, you know, West Asia may not be able to contain the number of refugees who go through ir irregular routes and channels and, you know, may even be victims of trafficking. And the fact that the European Union does not want to, uh, you know, consider these cases, which are which number in thousands at this point in time, uh, is something that is quite alarming, and that clearly shows their disregard for human rights. No matter how many, how much uh, these countries talk about human rights elsewhere, uh, we need to also consider the fact that uh, these uh, these countries do not really 
want uh, are going through a, a situation where they are uh, facing elections and they want to and they are facing pressures from the right wing who are using migrants and refugees as a plank uh, to further their political mileage and we usually see liberal or seemingly liberal central left governments uh, taking that very you know rightward shift when it comes to border policy recently we have seen germany uh, trying to implement a certain kind of border uh, policy uh, that did not really exist uh, before but pretty much is something that they are uh, putting in place in the coming months uh, with election seasons coming in. And that is something similarly happening elsewhere. Uh, places with right-wing governments, it's a very different case altogether where they have clearly and adamantly put in place, uh, you know, very uh, cruel, uh, and that is putting it finally, very cruel uh, border policies that essentially, uh, uh, you know, uh, includes attacking uh, refugee boats and you know refugee caravans and that creates more problems than actually solving any uh, issues at the current moment. Right Anish of course uh, we've also seen that in the recent times we've had European governments actually discuss or are conducting discussions to basically kind of try to find, figure out how to sort of share the burden as they call it of uh, refugees, you know, various, uh, you mentioned Germany, of course, Italy, another key player in these discussions. So could you also take us through what some of these discussions are? Well, the current discussions obviously revolve around uh, more or less how to, uh, as you pointed out, share the burden. But uh, this sharing the burden is something that is going to be very dicey because we already have several right-wing governments in Eastern Europe who are not at all ready to accept any refugees whatsoever. And that, and we have already seen Poland uh, earlier this afternoon uh, just threatening to veto any kind of policy that would require member nations to, uh, you know, accept and uh, you know a certain number of refugees or a certain number of quota. And that is something that shows a situation that Europe is right in right now. Obviously, uh, they they are they have failed completely and miserably to stop. The deluge of such refugees and irregular uh, immigrations, and that uh, that primarily has to do with the fact that many of these countries are themselves involved in wars and conflicts that they have no stakes in, but uh, you know is pretty much an extension of their imperialist past, and that is something that they do not want to consider. They do not want to consider, uh, you know, humane conditions, uh, inhumane conditions that most of these refugees have to uh, put up with. And obviously, Southern Europe, European nations are talking about, uh, you know, uh, putting up this mask of decency by talking about sharing the burden. But many of these countries themselves have, uh, you know, conducted very, uh, you know, very terrible uh, acts of violence against refugees. Uh, as government policy, we are not even talking about attacks on refugee camps, you know, attacks on refugees and migrants and people of color in these countries that are different like uh, from the government policies. But as government policies, they have included attacking refugees. And that is uh, essentially just takes away any kind of, uh, you know, moral uh, mileage they might have had in these discussions. And obviously, uh, you know, countries like Poland, uh, countries like Hungary, who are not, uh, who have a very clear policies about not, uh, you know, inducting any kind of refugees or any uh, migrants, uh, undocumented migrants into their territory uh, is going to pretty much stall these discussions, uh, you know, for the, no matter how much the German or the Italian or the French counterparts talk about how they are very close to such a deal. But this is definitely going to be, uh, you know, a big stumbling block in the in any kind of, uh, you know, such uh, migrant sharing deal that they were talking about. Right, Anish, so what it basically does seem or look like is that after wreaking havoc in various ways in various parts of the world, European countries now trying to say that, uh, you know, on the one hand, trying to talk uh, brand all of this as an issue of illegal, uh, of trafficking, of illegal migration, etc., and trying to push back uh, people who are fleeing from the crisis they seem to have caused themselves. Exactly. Uh, it is something that they just... I mean, obviously, they do not want to talk about it. They do not want to address it. But this is pretty much the situation that they are in right now. Right. Thank you so much, Anish, for talking to us. An issue we'll unfortunately have to keep uh, tracking continuously. So we'll come back to you soon on this.
That's all we have time for in this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Until then, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, do hit that subscribe button.